Oh, hey, Vision. Yeah. Wow, were you expecting to get any, some Steve Miller band at church today? I don't think so. And just tell me this. Would you rather go with Mitch or Justin Timberlake? I would go with Mitch, okay? I mean, really. I mean, really. We got a team up here, something special. So you can tell you, we got something today important to talk about. Part six of the journey, talk about God's perspective on money. Because money impacts all of us. Okay, and anybody in here, would you like to have some more money? Yes. Like, really? Be like, yeah. I heard him visual down here. Okay. Has anybody this, this year had any stress about money? We have. We get stressed about it. Money impacts a large part of our life, and God knows that. And God, as a part of our journey, he wants us walking with him and talk with him about these important things. Remember, we're talking this, uh, this series, the journey, and stage one. This is the final part of stage one, campfire talks. We literally like sit around the campfire in these chairs, and talk about the important things of life before you head out on your journey. And most definitely, if I sat down, took some of our teenagers, and said, man, Tommy, you're getting ready to go to college a year from now. Don't let money control you. Don't let money cause stress and tension in your life like it has for so many of us. God wants to get involved in that conversation. So with this day, take a look at your takeaway card and the bottom line, let God help you control your money so your money doesn't control you. I mean, literally, does anybody in here ever feel like money controls you or lack of money controls you and it adds stress to your life where we'd say you're going on your journey, let God help you control your money so it doesn't control you. And you're like, Matt, God just wants all my money then. No, no, he doesn't. When Jesus was on this earth, he had no desire to get this cash in his hands. He had no desire for that. Our heavenly father is the same way. He doesn't care about having money and stuff. He cares about you. He cares about your heart. He cares about your journey and your impact potential on your journey. So as we look at this today, we're going to take four key words that I think can help you on your journey. The first one is perspective. It's perspective. And God wants to help reshift our perspective because he knows how much damage can happen when you have the wrong perspective about money. Now, you know, last week I talked about, about marriage some, and in marriages, which outside of our relationship with Christ, marriage will be the most important relationship we have on this planet. The number one reason that couples break up, they get divorced, is because of money. So when I look at that, I say, okay, there's, there's something to it that money can damage and break up relationships. I want to figure out what's going on there. Because you know, the number two reason that couples break up or have problems is because of sex. Now, if you are here last week, you know, we talked about that. And this week, and I, I tried to follow up with some of y'all, texting and calling, calling at night, like, hey, give me any, any feedback on the message. And I wasn't hearing from many people. And the next day, I get texts saying, Matt, we couldn't talk. We were watching TV. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? The Panthers game one until Thursday. Oh, watching TV. Oh, yeah. But seriously, when you think about the things that, that damage our relationships, money is at the top of that list. I say, God, Help us with that. We want help figuring this out. So when we, uh, we consider letting God sit down with us and talk to us about the journey, we really need to kind of back up and evaluate how we think about God. So I need your help with something. Go ahead and grab your blue connection card. It's in the chair in front of you. Every person get one. If you're in the front row, turn around and make a friend and say, hey, can you give me a connection card? So right here in the front row. Turn around, get a connection card. I need everybody to have one in their hands. Everybody have a connection card. Now, with this connection card, I want to learn a little bit about you. So I want you to do is sometime during a message, put your know, first name or first and last name or your phone number, some way so I can know that it's you. What I want you to do now is think about your perspective of God. And you're going to fall into one of three categories, okay? If you're in a spot where you kind of came in today and you're like, hey, man, I, I'm, just, I'm just here because somebody invited me. I'm just here because I stayed at you know, a friend's house. They came to church. I came with them. I'm not really on this, this God track, then you're going to be no. You're saying, you know, no, God's not a part of your life right now. And I'm saying, that's okay. I'm glad you're here. The second category is somebody who would be searching. You're going to search. You'd say, okay, I'm, I'm here. I've come here a couple times. I'm kind of just trying to fly underneath the radar. And I'm searching to try to understand God more. And to you also, I'd say, I'm so glad you're here. And that God, if you're in the no category or the search category, God is smiling, saying, I'm so glad you're here to learn. Third category 
is you accept. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, then you write accept on there. So on your connection card, you, you take it and write either no, search, or accept. And you go ahead and even just fold it so nobody sees it. This is between you and God. And if you turn it in, I mean, I'd like to see it. I'd like to know where you're at. So as I design messages and preach to our, our family here at Vision, I kind of know where you're coming from. And that you'll be honest and say, really, man, I'm, I'm searching. And as I pray and put together a message and say, okay, let's talk from God's perspective, I want you to understand that God, he is comfortable if you're saying, I'm still searching about you, God, or I'm saying no to you right now, God, that God wants you to listen and to soak this in and take these concepts about money because God cares about you so much. So this first word, perspective. And with the connection cards, you can turn them in in the back at the end. I'll walk you through that at the end. But today, in regard to this, per this perspective, let me, uh, let me ask you this, and you answer. Are you rich? Not, not a whole lot of confidence in that. There's not too many people say, man, I, I'm rich. I am wealthy. I'm so rich. Okay, let me do this. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. I need your help with this. All right, now with everybody standing, everybody standing, let's, let's pretend that, you know, everybody's got some type of a, a value of how much you earn in a year, a value of earn. So we'd say, okay, this is 100% of our population. So let's go ahead and, and split it down right here, this row and over. All you guys sit down. All you guys sit down. So, so what we got left now, let's say that you guys are the 50%. You're the, you're the top 50% in terms of richness in this group. Would you feel pretty good about yourself? Yeah. You're, like, you're looking over there, I'm like, <laughs> don't you wish? Don't you wish you were as rich as me? You're like, okay, 50%. Now, now let's do this. Let's say, uh, you see Patrick is about halfway back in the blue. Raise your hand, Patrick. Patrick's row and Kylan's row and back, sit down. All right, so that cuts us down to about 25%. So we're looking, or maybe 20%. We're saying you guys, we'd say you guys are the richest 20% in the room. You, you feeling pretty good? Yeah. You're like, hey, I'm pretty good. All right, we're going we're gonna to trim this down a little bit. Uh, actually, you guys sit down. Okay, so we're down. I know, I'm sorry. Sorry, Freddie. <laughs> so we're down here to about the richest 10% in the room. Richest 10%. You're like, man. I mean, literally, if you walked in this room and you knew you were the richest 10%, you'd feel pretty good, wouldn't you? All right, we're going to cut it down more. Here, over, y'all sit down. Front row, y'all sit down. And actually, Sean, you sit down. So we've got two left standing, because in a room of about 200, we would say, this is the richest 1% in the room. Would you guys feel pretty good about life? If you knew that you made more money than anybody else in the room, would you guys feel pretty good? You would, okay, so you guys go ahead and sit down. So think about this. If your family makes at least $32,000 a year, you're in the richest 1% of the world. You understand that? You're like, man, I'm, I'm not rich. No, no, no. If, you, if, I said, if you're in the top 1% of richness in the world, would you say you're rich? I'd say, man, I'm rich. There's 99%. The rest of the room that sat down, like 1%. If you make over 32,000 as a family, you're the top 1% richest in the world. Now, when, when we look around the world and say, okay, so, so are we wealthy? Well, you know, if wealth is measured by what you have, in Africa, the average family has, if they cashed in, they got $400 worth of wealth. India, they've got $600 worth of wealth. You take it to Europe, $11,000. If the fam average family cashes it in, so they got $11,000. United States, $49,000. And you're like, $49,000 compared to four hundred, Man, maybe we are rich. So back to that question, are you rich? If you're in the top 1%, if you are probably got more wealth than people in Europe and in India and in Africa, let's shift our perspective a little bit. Say, okay, God, you, you put something in our hands. We have an opportunity here in terms of wealth that, yes, maybe we are rich. Well, Life tells us, though, here in America, <laughs> you still need more. Man, you need a bit the better car. I mean, I've seen your car. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's looking a couple years old. You got you're like 20,000 miles on it. You know, you're, you're, you're old. You need something better, shinier, or else you're not successful. You need the bigger house. You know, you've been in that house for a couple years. I mean, you know, man, you need another room. You need another floor. You need a better neighborhood, or else you're just not successful without that bigger, better house. Doesn't life tell you you need that job that pays more? You need that, that, that status. You need that office with a view or else, honestly, you're, really, you're, you're not wealthy. You're not rich. And I'm not saying there's things wrong with nice cars and nice houses and nice jobs, but it's about perspective. 
You know, there, there was a time in our country, they actually printed $100,000 bills. Wouldn't you like to have one of those? I mean, just one. Like, come on, come on, just give me one of those. I think that, that life through dollar bills and jobs and cars and houses and stuff, they say they push this at us and say, you're, you're not rich. You got to keep pushing for more. Don't be content with what you have. God says, wait a second. Let's, let's pull back from that. Let's reevaluate whether you're controlling your money or your money is controlling you. So I'd ask this. How important is money when you find out you have cancer? How important is money when you have a relationship that is fractured and you either can't talk to somebody or don't even know where they're at anymore or they're gone out of your life and say, man, I don't, I don't care about money. I just want them back. How important is money when you can't get out of bed because you're depressed or you're discouraged or you're lonely and say, like, hey, I don't care what the number says in a bank account. It does not matter. And it aligns your perspective a little bit differently than a bunch of dollar bills that mean so much to us so often. And in the Bible, we look to God for help because he wants to help us with this. Take a look. Paul, he writes this guy, Timothy. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And you're like, yeah, I knew it was in there. Money, money's evil. No, 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 money's not evil. Money in itself is not a good or a bad thing. It's like last week with the fire. The fire in the right place, a good thing. The fire in a forest fire is a bad thing. Same thing with money. Money is not evil. It's when we put it literally above God, above people, when we shift the way we think and pursue money, it becomes a root of all kinds of evil. Paul goes on and says, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith, and don't miss this, this phrase, and pierced themselves with many griefs. Have you ever seen somebody in your life that you can tell has been pierced with grief because of money? They say, man, I, I, I wish that relationship had made it, but we, we just couldn't. We argued about money. I, I wish I wasn't so stressed. I'm stressed all the time. And you're like, oh, it's because of, of money. And, and something in somebody has shifted to where there is piercing of grief because of money. And God says, no, it doesn't have to be that way on your journey. It can be different. It can be better. Ecclesiastes 5 says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Let me tell you this about, about wealth and riches. I was, I was researching it this week. It said people in America that are worth one to five million dollars, if you ask them, say, are, are you wealthy? Only 28% of them say, yeah, I'm, I'm wealthy. They're worth over a million dollars. People worth over five million dollars, you ask them that question, only 60% of them say, I'm wealthy. I'm like, that's crazy. How can they not see that they're wealthy? Honestly, it's the same thing. We go back to us and however much we're making compared to where we could be, somewhere in the world, somewhere struggling. And God says, you are wealthy. You're provided for. You are rich. So for each of these words, I'm going to give you some values in having that word. Remember this first one, perspective, value, a healthier life. I think we would all agree that if, if we didn't stress about money so much, we'd be healthier. You say, well, Pastor Matt, I just need more money. No, more money will help some things, but this is a heart issue we're talking about today. This isn't a number issue in your bank account. This is a heart issue. The value and perspective is a healthier life. If you ever come in to me to talk about marriage and I'm giving you marriage counseling, one of the things we're talking about is money, because I'm telling you, you're going to have a healthier marriage if you have a healthier perspective on money. The stats just show it. And that third thing there about having lower stress, we all put our hands up earlier saying we, we've been stressed about money. God wants to get in there and help you with that. Lower your stress with a different perspective. Now, the second word is stewardship. Stewardship, because a lot of times I think we just get this perspective that, hey, everything that we've got, everything that we own is ours. The house, the car, the money, the, even the ability to go to work, and it's, it's on me. I made that happen. And God says, wait a second. Actually, you're, you're not an owner of those things. You're a steward of those things. And when we look at God and say, okay, God, actually, everything you put in my hands, it's actually yours. I'm just stewarding it or managing it on this journey. It changes everything. Now, okay, has anybody ever missed work because you had like a bad back or you were sick or you're like, you, you were in the bed and could not get out? When you're in that moment, aren't you grateful for health? Uh, now, now, listen, back, back when I was in college, I remember this, this, this moment when my back, it went out like it never had before. And I, I was, I was uh, shuffling through the dining hall and I sat down to eat and my back hurt so bad. And I remember this, this bitterness like came over me as I looked at people and it's like, 
These people have no idea they got a healthy back. They're even thankful for it. Oh, and, and, and God like tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Matt, that was you 24 hours ago. That was you walking around, not even knowing you had a healthy back, not even knowing that you, you know, really, I don't say I, I was stewarding health that I could go out and do things. We get in this spot, we say, hey, I, I work hard. I go to work and make it happen. It's my money. God says, no, I've, I've given you the health to do that. So make sure we don't miss it. That stewardship is a gift from God. Matthew 6, Jesus simply said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Your treasure, you look at your checkbook, your bank account, where your money's going, it shows where your heart is. And God says, if you have a stewardship mentality that it's not yours, but it's God's to use, it makes it a whole lot easier to shift your heart to things that moves God's heart. And God is going to work in your life. He's going to bless you when you think like that. And the nuts and bolts of this is having a financial strategy. It's valuing saving, getting out of debt. It, it's, you say, man, I, I didn't come to church for a financial seminar today. Well, well, listen, God is so interested in your finances, not because he wants your money, because he wants your journey to be successful. And if you just let it just slide and drift, he says, no, there needs to be a plan here. Let me be a part of that plan. There's value in that. Proverbs 27 says, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. They're talking to them in those days about their stuff and knowing what's going on with their stuff and managing it well. Same thing with us. So if you come to talk to me and say, man, our, our marriage is struggling or I'm, I'm stressed out about money, what we're going to talk about is, okay, well, how much do you make and how are you spending it? If you're like, I, I don't know where we're spending it. I don't know where it's going. Say, God is not going to get right in the middle of that and help you until you choose to have some structure and some strategy. So the value of having the stewardship mentality is we're less attached to our stuff when it goes away. Honestly, it, it is. I'm not saying stuff isn't important, but we will change our perspective of it when our stuff slips to our hands or when somebody you know, scratches our car or when something happens to our house or we, you know, something costs us some more money and we freak out. So wait a second, God, it's, it's yours. You, know, you, you got this. I'm just a steward on this journey of what you've given me. Now, this ties into number three, generosity. And generosity, you know, I, I love it because our culture here at Vision is one of generosity. So let me ask you this, and you respond, are you a generous person? In fact, if, you're, if you think you're generous and you're, like, you're being humble, you're like, hey, I like being generous. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let me see it. Okay, so hold your hands up. Hold your hands up. Because I, I love being on a journey with people that are generous. So, okay, so let me do this. You know, God, when he talks, you put your hands down. When he talks about being generous, and we're kind of like, okay, God, from a distance, that feels good. You know, I like it when God, you kind of like talk about it and generosity is in my face. Well, sometimes, honestly, God, he, like, he kind of like gets you know, like inside our comfort zone a little bit. And you're like, whoa, man, this, this doesn't feel right. And Scott's like, okay, I had my hand up. Is Matt coming over here to ask for some money? And, and God's like, no, no, that's, that's not why I'm getting in your world. I'm, I'm coming over here because I value relationship. I want to be close to you. Whoever here said they're generous? Who had hands up to generous? I did. I saw, I saw some hands over here that said generous. Who, who on that side of the room said they're generous? Because God, when he, he kind of gets in your world. He's like, you know, I, I want to be a part of the lives of people who are generous. And this isn't just a, a thing where God says, okay, I, need, I need all your money. God says, I want your heart to be committed to generosity. So uh, let me ask you guys this. Anybody here like M&M cookies? Yes. M&M cookies. Yeah, Mario does. I, I like M&M cookies. I like M&Ms. I like cookies. They, they, it's a win. So, so this, this concept of M&M cookies and how it makes people smile. Okay, I got, I got this box. I got this box of M&M cookies here. 30 packs of them. And so, so what, if, you know, what if I didn't look at this like a steward? I'm like, I look at this like, like I, I own these cookies. You know? I, I got these cookies. They're my cookies. Pack a day. Well, that's like a different kind of habit, I guess, right? Pack a day of uh, <laughs> M&Ms. And uh, I love these cookies. But what about from God's perspective? God says, okay, I have got resources that I want to distribute. So let me do this. Freddie, come up here. Freddie, just step up here a second. Because Freddie said he, he's generous. And so I have asked him into this part of the journey with me where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you a deal. Do you like M&M cookies? I love M&M cookies. cookies. Yeah. Now, I'll make you a deal. I will give you these if you promise to give them all away except for the last pack will be yours. 
You can't give them away in this room because last hour they start passing them out already. People are hounding them and kill them. Give me some cookies. No, no, you can't do it in this room. Maybe in that hallway, but definitely in your week or whatever you do. But if you will commit to me that you'll be like a steward with those and you'll be generous to give them away. You'll do that? Yes. Okay, there are your cookies. And God, yeah. And God looks at us and says, man, I, I want somebody to pour through. I want somebody with the perspective, with the stewardship, with, with a generous spirit. I want that. And Jesus, you know, he taught about this in Luke 12. He said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. You know, Freya could be greedy with those and keep them. Or maybe some, some of you guys are like, man, I wish I had those cookies. Give me those cookies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out Freddie in the bathroom and get his cookies. Okay? And, and Jesus is like, watch out for that. that. I know we laugh about it, but that stirs up inside of us, and it's greed that creeps up. And Jesus says, watch out for that. Because life, honestly, isn't even about those cookies. Because come next Sunday, you know, I'll look for Freddie or from uh, the first hour with Susan. I'll say, hey, how did it go pass out the cookies? And I'm sure they'll be like, man, more people smiling, people excited. I even saw one person open up and share them with other people. And it's a, it's a heart issue of sharing. It's not really, obviously, about the stuff. So Paul, he continued in 1 Timothy. Remember, he started talking to, to Timothy about this, this love of money being a root of all kinds of evil. He continues down here in verse 17 and says, command those who are rich in this present world. And remember, we've already kind of dialed this in to say, we're all rich. This verse isn't for the millionaire or the billionaire. This verse is for you. It's for each of us. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in their wealth. I mean, if you're like me, there's times your hope is like rising and falling by, by like what's in your bank account. It's rising and falling on like the stability of your job or if you got all the bills paid. God's saying through Paul, don't, don't put your hope in that. Your hope in that wealth, mm, it's so uncertain Instead, put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them. Remember, he's talking to us, the rich. They command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, oh, this is great. There's a reward. In this way, they will lay up for themselves treasure as a firm foundation for the coming age. So they may, be, they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So make sure you don't miss this. Whatever you wrote on that connection card it impacts how you feel about treasure. Because if you put on that connection card, except you're saying, I believe that Jesus has another kingdom, that when we die, we're gonna go somewhere and my faith in Christ will take me to that kingdom and what I'm doing on this planet is storing up treasure. If you put search or no, and you're kind of wrestling with that, I wanna encourage you honestly to sit back and let God speak to your heart. And whether you sense some depth in this, what I'm saying, there's another kingdom. There's another place where treasure matters more than here. It just does. All right, anybody in here ever heard about a cash mob? A cash mob? We, we did something really strange last year called a cash mob. Now, um, let me get an idea of how new our crowd is here. If you started coming to Vision since January, since January you started coming to Vision, raise your hand. Let me, let me see hands. We had a bunch in the first hour too. Okay, so if you're new here, new, you haven't heard of the cash mob. This past December, we took a group of people out to act generously. And we, we got some pictures of it where they went into Walmart and gave away money. And you're like, what? Why would people do that? There's Kim passing out there. There's some lady here crying because she's getting money. This even led to where we had a, uh, uh, the newspaper did an article about it. They talked about this cash mob where literally people came together and said, okay, we're, we want to be generous. How can God work through us? The, the full video is posted on our Facebook page. Take a quick look at uh, a little glimpse of what cash mob is about. Hey, what's going on, guys? This is uh, the conservative entrepreneur here. Uh, listen, I am so excited right now. I, I showed, uh, showed up here at my church tonight because I called my pastor about 10, 12 days ago and had this idea about being able to go out and just bless some families right before Christmas. And it seemed crazy, but all of a sudden now, it's all come together, and we got a whole bunch of people doing it, and we're about to do it. So this is Pastor Matt from Vision Church. I'm going to let him tell you what we're about to do. Well, hey, guys, it's great to meet you. And uh, you can see we got a bunch of crazy people here at Vision Church because we're about to head over 
to Walmart and Franklin Square, there's four people who have no idea they're about to be blessed by a cash mob tonight. So what we're doing is we're heading over there. Bill's going to identify somebody. And then when he has, his says cash mob, we're going to move up that person and give them each $5 from every person in this room. That's a good stack of money they're going to get. And I'm going to bring up the rear, tell them they've been blessed by a Vision Church cash mob, and Merry Christmas. And that's it. So when Bill came to me with this idea, I said this is totally like Vision. To do something that's kind of off the charts, some kind of crazy, but something that will bless somebody and let them know that God loves them. So Bill, I think we're ready to go in. And here we go. Woo! All right, Mallory, I see you smiling. You were there that night, weren't you? It's so cool. Understand, each person that was holding four or five dollar bills, they, they brought that money. This one, like, let's go to the Vision Vault and like pull out, you know, this money and pass it out. That's honestly, there's there's nothing generous in that. It's when you show up with four or five dollar bills and say, we're gonna go over there and honestly trust that Bill will prayerfully identify somebody and say, cash mob, lane five, descend. Five dollar bills pile up. I walk up and give them a little invite card and say, you've been blessed. We walk away. And that's it. There's, there's no tug. There's no pressure. We blessed them with that. We're going to do it again in December because we believe this is a picture of generosity, like frivolous, crazy, unpredictable generosity. In fact, 50,000 people watched that video. I mean, it just it went all over. We believe God wants to work through us in that way all the time. It's our generosity. It's fun. When God does it, I mean, honestly, Freddie is going to have fun today, this week, whenever, passing out cookies because God wants to work through us. So let's talk about the value of generosity. First of all, it breaks the grip of materialism. All right, are there any parents in here who might just have kids that are kind of materialistic? They like their stuff, okay? And the reality is we all like our stuff. Every, every human being likes their stuff. We're constantly fighting against materialism. One way God says to do it is to be generous. When you give and you bless somebody, it literally breaks the grip of materialism on you, on kids, on your family. Another value, it leads to more contentment. It totally does. When you give and you realize that somebody got something and they're so grateful for $5, you're like, wow, man, that, that makes me feel even better about the, the last $10 I have. I thought I was pitiful. I only had $10. I got $10. I got a home, I got a roof, I got a pantry full of food. It truly feeds contentment. And then the last one there, that you'll be blessed when you see others blessed. Oh, that's totally what happened in Walmart. That's what will happen to Freddie. That's what can happen with you when you commit to a life of generosity. Now, number four, this one's a little tougher. Sacrifice. That you literally, you, you give in a way that it costs you something. God totally honors this. Because really, honestly, it's rare. God's looking for people that will say, I will sacrifice. I will give in a way that will bless somebody that it, it's even going to cost me something. You know, in Mark chapter 12, there's a story of Jesus when he was in the temple and people were coming in to give. And I'll see so many of them were doing it for the show. And they were like dropping their coins and money in there, making sure it made a lot of noise. And people saw it and they, they saw, hey, I'm, I'm giving. I'm giving a lot. Big old bag of stuff. And some lady comes in, kind of shuffles in, widow, little plink. And of course, nobody else noticed it, but Jesus said, wait a second, did you see what she did? Jesus said, she didn't give because she had a big old bucket of stuff and gave one little thing. She gave all that she had. She sacrificed. And so for generations now, we, we see this lady who sacrificed and caught the eye of the Son of God. And Jesus said, that's the one who sacrificed. So when you say, man, I, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot to give. Jesus isn't saying you have to give a lot. He's saying for you, you scale it to find out what sacrifice is for you. And God will meet you there. And he'll work and do something. Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. That literally, you got to make a commitment. Say, hey, the wealth I have, I'm going to use it to honor God. I'm going to sacrifice when he says sacrifice, be generous. I'm going I'm to be content. I'm going to be a steward. I'm going to honor God with it. Because in Malachi 3 God does something almost shocking. The only place in the Bible where he says we can test him. It says in Malachi 3, bring the whole tithe, a tenth, into the storehouse. You know, our storehouse is right here. 10,000 square feet in the corner of Hudson Union. This is our storehouse. We say, would you consider 
bringing your tithe, your tenth into the storehouse and saying, God, do something with that. And God, I'm trusting you. The other 90% I got, I, I need you. I need you to do something miraculous with that. So he writes in here, says that there may be food in the house. Test me in this, says the Lord. Test me. It's really amazing that the God of creation would give you the liberty to test him. He says, if you will test me, I will show you my power. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. I'll pour out so much blessing, there won't be room enough to store it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And all the nations, they'll call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land. Now, now I, I had prayed about whether to share this, because I, I, it's, honestly, this is something, what you give is personal. And when our finance team manages it here, it's personal. But for me and Meg, we've been on this, this journey of following God for about 20 years. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to share this because truly it's, it's not about me. It's more about God's faithfulness. For 20 years, we have been trusting this principle, trusting this concept. So if you think over the last 20 years, if we've been around like that, that average household income, say $50,000, 10% of that is $5,000. For 20 years, whatever church we're at, wherever God has us, we give that so that literally you could pile up on this table $100,000. 20 years of $5,000, $100,000, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. I say, God, should I really have done that? <laughs> that's a lot of money. God says, well, Matt, how, how, how's your marriage doing? How are your kids doing? How, how's your home you've lived in and never worried about making a payment? How's your pantry that's full? How's your health? How, how, Matt, how about the miracles you've seen at Bit of Hope Ranch and Vision Church? He says, Matt, have you ever really been in a spot where you've gone without? I said, Matt, have I worked in your life in a way that is so miraculous? I said, God, absolutely. He said, well, Matt, you might have missed that. He said, Matt, a, a pile of dollar bills up here. He said, yeah, it's, it's sacrifice, but still, it's just a thing. And I don't tell you that and say, wow, man, Pastor Matt and Meg, they're, they're so faithful. No, we're not. We're just obedient. And God says, with obedience in your life, I will also work miracles. Say, okay, well, if I, if I want to do that at Vision, I mean, what, what kind of miracles are we talking about? We're talking about a community of people committed to being generous and sacrificial so that we can go out and feed homeless. I mean, we, we take people to go and feed other people that don't have a home, that don't have food, because somebody gave, literally, that we go over there and feed them dinner because somebody here gave. We take people across the street to the seniors and go to say to some of these people that have kind of been forgotten or neglected, we go over and bless them with food and gifts and say, we love you in the name of Jesus. And part of what we're saying is somebody here gave so we could have stuff to go give them. We go to Southwest Middle School, two miles from here. We feed their teachers. We bless their students. We take care of their staff. We can't buy a biscuit unless somebody gave. We can't buy them coffee unless somebody gave. And we see a platform that we've created to speak into 800 students and 100 staff members because somebody gave. We have a project where people go out and give water bottles. That somebody paid for water bottles or labels or the cards or whatever, or the shirts people wear. Somebody gave and we go out and give water bottles and people have come to our church and other people have said, man, God gave me that water in that moment. I needed it because somebody gave. Anybody remember when Watoto came last December? Woo, man, that was, that was amazing. These kids came from Africa, and they came on this stage, and I said, we thought we were going to be like, you know, entertained by music. It was worship-filled environment at our church when these kids got up here and poured out their heart in worship to God, and we got to worship with them, and this is so cool. They go on all these stops throughout the country. As far as I know, we were the only stop that the next morning, you know, you give them breakfast before they leave, we were the only stop that gave every child a Christmas present. We said, because people give here, we can go and buy a Christmas gift for every kid in Watoto. We got also partners in South Africa that we send money to monthly saying, pour into leaders that pour into Christians that grow the influence of the gospel in South Africa. That's what we do because people give. We send kids to camp. We you know, buy their shirts, we pay for scholarships, we pay for the counselors to go, we send snacks with them. Honestly, we couldn't do that 
if nobody gave. These kids then, they come in on Sunday mornings and they get, they get music and they get teaching and they get all kinds of fun experiences where they say, we got to come to church. Mom and dad, bring me back to church. I say all those props, all that curriculum, all that stuff, because somebody gave. We send teenagers to camp. They have gone to camp, spent time with leaders, with music, teaching, small groups, and these students go because somebody gave for scholarships, somebody else gave for food, somebody gave and said, I will sacrifice. So that a teenager can go and get an environment to hear about Jesus. And then they come in here every other Sunday night. Look at the size of that group. We are packed out with teenagers. And we can give them food and play games and put, turn on the lights and do all these things because somebody gave. We get to do women's events. You know, last December, we had a big old Christmas thing in here. Once a quarter, we had women's events. You say, hey, we're going to charge either nothing or very little because we will steward what somebody gave so we can bless women and they can invite their friends. And in fact, with the women, as we look ahead to December, God is growing that so strong. We've already committed that our women's event this year is two nights. It's too big to contain in one night. We'll have to do it twice. So ladies, you get ready to invite your friends because somebody's giving and we're providing the environment. For our men, we went up to Black Mountain last fall and, you know, somebody gave. So there could be scholarships, there could be supplies, there could be all these other details to take our men off site for 24 hours, pour into them so they'd come back. And like this next picture shows that men would be compelled to get on their knees and say, I want to be different. I want to live for Christ. I want to lead my family. I want to be men of purity. I want to be men of honor. And so guys, if you hadn't signed up yet for the men's retreat, I'm telling you, this is the opportunity of the year for our men. You stop by the tent today and ask. Again, that comes from people giving. We can have events like that. Our worship services every Sunday, the things that happen in here, whether praying, music, the message, because somebody gave and we have power, we have supplies, we have first time guest gifts, all that because somebody gave. We go off site, we have church picnics. We get to have fun in the rain, I guess. And you know, all of it's, it's like rain or shine. We get out there and people gave and they brought food and, they, and we had supplies and we loved on people and build relationships at our picnics. We had a volunteer celebration here in June. You know, some churches our age would be so excited to have 150 people. That night we had 150 volunteers that came in here. We set up tables and served barbecue and gave away stuff, gave away shirts, all the stuff to say, we love you and we can do more because somebody gave. And then last but not least, we get to have baptism services. Like when we went out to the pool because somebody gave and we could rent the pool and we could have snow cones and we could give away shirts. And I, I see you know, some of these, these made new shirts you see walking around here. You, you, you can't buy one of those. Those are not for sale at the Connection Center. But when we baptize people and give them a made new shirt to affirm what God's doing in their life, we say literally, because somebody gave, we could do this. We could have this service. We could have a church that leads you to Christ. And this final picture you see in the lobby where every Sunday after a baptism, we put all those out there and brag on God and say, God, you are doing miracles in our church. And God says, I'm going to do that in a place where people are generous, where they sacrifice, where they're stewards, where they have a perspective. So I say the value in sacrifice is that God will reward you. I promise you. You give sacrificially, God will reward you, and you will inspire others. I hope what I'm sharing will inspire you. I love when I hear people giving. You know, we had some students this year who gave for scholarships for camp. I mean, that inspires me to want to give more. So that's the value in sacrificial giving. Now to close, Jesus talked about not serving two masters. But it was strange how he didn't say, well, you can't serve God and Satan. He said, you can't serve God and money. Because he knew the grip that money can have in our lives. The stress it can cause, the contentment it can just beat down. Jesus said, now, don't let money get higher up on that throne than your heavenly father. He said, you're going to love one, serve the other, love one, serve the other. He said, you got to make a choice. A heart issue about who you're going to serve. So remember that bottom line, God wants to help you so your money doesn't control you. God wants you to control your money. He cares about that on your journey.